So now that we know how our letters work with sharps and flats, we can begin working with half steps too. Until now, we have worked with interval names, but now we can also count the half steps in intervals. So for example, if we want to know how many half steps we have in a major third, we can look to C major, where we know we have no sharps or flats, and first find that major third. So what is the major third from C? E. E. So we can use the simple C major scale as a reference point in this way. We know we have no sharps or flats, so we go, okay, when well, there's a major third, let's go to C major, C to E. Now we can identify how many half steps a major third has. Now that we know from B to C and E to F, we have only a half step. Looking from C to E, you can tell me how many half steps a major third has. Five. When you're counting the half steps, you're not counting letters like before. You're counting the actual spaces. Four. So we have C to C sharp, one, C sharp to D, two, D to D sharp, three, D sharp to E, four. So the major third has four half steps, which means the minor third has three. Three, we know we were lowering notes a half step to find the minor third. So the minor third has three half steps. So is D to F a major or a minor third? One, two, three, minor. Minor. So whichever way is simpler for you, you, know, you can count in half steps or you can check in the case of the minor third, you know, am I crossing a, a small space or not? And here we are between E and F, no? When we go from D to F. So we have a minor third, three half steps. How about B to D? Is that a minor third or a major third? Major. How did you work it out? Counting the half steps. And how many did you count? One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> I counted four. Yeah, so three, three half steps, minor. Well done. So we just saw that B to D is a minor third. So the major third from B is? D sharp. D sharp. So now that we know from B to C and E to F, we have only a half step, we can now process the intervals we come across in terms of half steps to better understand and identify them. When we set notes up in a scale, each scale degree actually has a name. So the first note or degree of the scale, the fundamental note, is called the tonic. So instead of fundamental note, we say tonic when discussing scales and key. The tonic of the key is the tone behind the whole scale. That's where tonic comes from, tone. It's the note or the tone that offers the key to understanding the remaining notes in the scale. So the word tonic comes from tone. This is the tone of which the scale is a mere elaboration. So what is the tonic in C major? C. C. And in C minor? C. Good. C. And the tonic note in D major? D. D, of course. So the first degree of the scale is called the tonic. It's the tone that birthed the other tones, the beginning, the note whose existence causes the other note's existence. The tonic created the scale simply by multiplying itself, just like the number one does when we count. The second note of the scale is called the supertonic. So super, supertonic, means above the tonic. Super as in supernatural, beyond natural, or superar in Spanish, to get over. It's beyond or over the tonic. So what is the supertonic of C major? So D. D. We know C major and A minor have no sharps or flats, so there's no guesswork here, just counting. What interval does a supertonic represent? It's a new one, but you can name it. If the supertonic of C major is D, what interval do we have there? Remember there's two parts, there's a part for number and a part for quality. Could it be a first? We include the letter we start on. So how many letters do we have? So you... just C to D is just one. What is the perfect fifth of A? E. And how many letters are those? Five. So it's two, second, major, second. 
a major second. D is from C's overtones and it's not perfect so it's major. C to D is a major second. How many half steps does a major second have? One, two. Two. We have C sharp or D flat, no, between C and D. So we have two half steps. So if the major second means two half steps, what is the supertonic of B major? So the major second represents two half steps. So what is the major second of B? What is the supertonic of B major? C sharp. C sharp. B to C, we have only a half step. So the supertonic of B major is C sharp. Well done. So when we think about music in cardinal numbers, one and it's double, two represent the octave, and then we scale down the remaining numbers to fit between them. The supertonic comes in at 1.125, which if we continue to double, we eventually find the number nine. This means the number nine corresponds to which musical interval? Which interval is the musical manifestation of number nine? What interval does the supertonic give us? Major second. Major second. So nine represents the supertonic or the major second. Now, being able to perceive the supertonic as nine allows us to see so very clearly something that somebody would generally need much more musical training to spot. So there's something special about number nine, no? What is it? You can divide by three. Bravo, it's divisible by three, no? Three fits into nine three times. What interval did number three represent? Third, major third. When we were looking at our cardinal numbers, no? And scaling them down, you can, you can half it, you can half three, and bring it between one and two, if you don't remember. Perfect fifth. The perfect fifth. So three represents the perfect fifth. So what is nine to three in general terms? So if we say three is a note, what is nine to three? Overtone. Brilliant. What overtone? So double would be six, so it's the perfect fifth, 1.5. So nine is the perfect fifth of three. This means that the supertonic is the perfect fifth of the perfect fifth. So thinking in terms of cardinal numbers helps us see this very clearly, whereas we need to be much more familiar with what note pairs give us what intervals to spot it. Of course, we can much more readily spot such relationships between numbers rather than letters, so we can confirm the relationships we've seen afterwards through the letter names. We can do this to check our comprehension. So what is the perfect fifth of A? E. E. And what is the perfect fifth of E? B. B. Of course, the supertonic of A. So counting in fifths from A, we go A, E, B. No? So going from A, B is the perfect fifth of the perfect fifth. Or in other words, three is to one what nine is to three. So we know that the perfect fifth is as far as possible from the tonic that we can get. And if the supertonic is the perfect fifth of the perfect fifth, then it is the farthest point from the farthest point, making it the closest point to the tonic, the supertonic. So being familiar with numbers in this way allows us to spot straight away musical relationships that we otherwise might not notice. So the supertonic has a special function as being the furthest point from the furthest point within a scale, the perfect fifth of the perfect fifth. So in both major and minor scales, the supertonic represents number nine or the major second. It may be for this reason that the major second is the only major interval in both major and minor scales. The rest of the major intervals become minor for the minor scale. Again, we see the insistent importance of the perfect fifth, the divine interval. Even the perfect fifth of the perfect fifth is so important, it is major in both major and minor scales. So before, when I explained how we don't include number 13 in our major scales representation of counting, because if we did, 
we would have a diminished fifth within the scale, it is actually with the supertonic or the major second that this diminished fifth would occur if we included number 13. Between the supertonic and where number 13 would come in, scaled down a half step above the perfect fifth. It doesn't because we don't include number 13 in the major scale. Fascinatingly, what has in English become Friday the 13th, in Spain or Greece, for example, is Tuesday the 13th. In Italy, the fabled day of bad luck is Friday the 17th. It looks like the English might be a bastard mix of the two European dates, because the European unlucky days seem to represent the diminished fifth. There are seven days, as there are seven degrees of a scale, and so if Tuesday represents the second degree of the scale, the supertonic, then of course we find the diminished fifth in Tuesday the 13th. Amazingly, if you do the same with Italy's Friday the 17th, taking Friday as the fifth degree of the scale and 17 to represent an overtone, once we scale 17 down to 1.0675, which sits just between the tonic and the supertonic, with that we create a diminished fifth with the perfect fifth of the scale. And so the English Friday 13th may well be a mix of these two European unlucky days, Tuesday 13th and Friday 17th, which both appear to represent the diminished fifth. What a coincidence or what an obsession.